This happened years ago, but I still think of it often, and refer to it as my scariest story. I was 20, and had just gotten my first car, a Ford Mustang convertible. It wasn't actually worth the price I paid for it, but I loved it dearly. My favourite thing in the world is to drive late at night on abandoned roads, and I was even more in love with it when I was 20 than now. I decided to take my car for a drive, and bear with me as I describe roads to you, because it does have bearing, I promise. I lived in the Denver metro area in Colorado at the time, and my favourite roads were the mountain roads. This time, however, I wanted to stay in range of cell service, as I'd been talking to a new butte. So I drove down to Golden to follow Highway 93, along the front range up to Broomfield or Boulder. It's usually a pretty good and solitary drive at night, and as it was around 1am, I knew I'd have the road all to myself. All was going pretty well. I had passed the road work and cop at the 72nd junction, and decided to get off on a road in Broomfield that would take me east, perpendicular to Highway 93 down a looping hilly street, until I reached Indiana Street, Indiana, parallels Highway 93 until it ends against a road further south, close to where my home was. As I was turning onto Indiana, I saw the first cars I'd seen other than the cop at the 72nd and Highway 93. There was a large diesel pickup in front of me, and a red hatchback in front of them, also turning south onto Indiana. The hatchback, however, was going frustratingly slow. Indiana Street is a very hilly road, with speed limit of 50 or 55, and there are only two lanes, north and south. The truck decided after a while of us tooling behind the hatchback at 25, to cross the double yellow and go around the hatchback. They sped off into the distance risking the low visibility of the hills, got back over, and disappeared out of my sight. The hatchback hadn't changed speed, but I decided to hang out behind them, because the night was fine. I was in no rush, and I was scared of crossing the double yellow. Death Proof is my favourite car movie, but the images of head-on collisions never go away. I was confused at this point about the motives of the hatchback driver, but it didn't seem too horrible, so I stayed a car's lengths back and waited, going at about 25 miles per hour still. I checked my phone only to find that it was dead, and as I had only recently brought the car, I didn't have a charger with me for the cigarette port. This made me even more uneasy. When the hatchback slammed their brakes and came to a complete stop, and I couldn't see an animal or anything to warrant it, I was freaked out enough to overcome my fears. I crossed the double yellow and sped up to pass them, but they sped up too. Thinking it was a mistake, I sped up more, reaching the actual speed limit of 50 or 55. They matched me and I was swiveling my head, trying to see into the driver's side window and looking out for incoming headlights at each hilltop. I sped up more, this time 65, and still nothing gives. They're matching me, and keeping me from getting in front of them. I slowed down backing off, but they slowed down too. Finally, scared out of my mind, I punched the gas bringing me up to 80 and slipped back over the double yellow. They tried to match my speed, but I'd been significantly ahead of them for long enough to get over, although I was scared of scraping bumpers, as they were so close. I didn't know what to expect, 
But when they started bumping the back of my car with theirs, I was in full freakout mode. I knew that 72nd was coming up, and if I took a right on it, I would get back to Highway 93, and the safety of the cop. So I turned my blinker on the far right of the junction to let this person know I intended to get out of their way for good. They didn't back off. If I slowed down, the pressure against my back bumper merely increased. We were still barreling along at a white knuckle speed of 65 to 70. As we passed 72nd, without me being able to turn off Indiana. The next road coming up was Laden Gulch Road, and to my surprise they started to back off. I flicked my blinker without thinking, wanting to get away from them ASAP, but of course they followed me onto the road, continuing to press at my back bumper until we were going at 60 and a 45, with no real street lamps and a lot of curves. I couldn't remember if Leyden Gulch Road went all the way to 93, but I was praying it did when I started to see cones and signs of roadwork along the side of the road. Suddenly, I saw a road closed sign moved off the left of the road, as if it had been in the middle earlier that day, but I instinctively slowed down thinking about cartoon characters flying off the edge of a cliff where a bridge used to be. Luckily, the hatchback behind me slowed down too. We slowed down to a reasonable 35, and I thought the danger was over when the road ahead turned to gravel. And suddenly, I was driving past mounds of dirt and gravel several times bigger than my car. I tried to make a U-turn, but the piles were too close together, and I ended up horizontal, trapped between three piles to either side and behind me. Ever since I'd gotten in front of it, they'd had their brights on, and I couldn't make out a face or license plate. Now, as they drove up the middle of the road perpendicular to me, I was blinded and panicked. I tried to think of what could make them, whoever they were, hesitate or think twice. I settled for looking cocky and almost smirking, eyebrows raised. I'm a girl, so seeing a girl who should be hella freaked out looking amused and self-assured would be weird in this situation. I imagined if I had a gun or some secret weapon up my sleeve, they wouldn't want to mess with me. There was a really long silence, during which I started to wonder, what if they had a gun, and what was going on? Finally, I heard their car door quietly shut. The silence and yelling, or lack of road rage, and explanations freaked me out. So I decided to risk driving my car directly on top of one of the piles hoping to go slanted up across the side of the pile and around their car. I kept my face locked on a screw you kind of face and hit the gas, looking at where I presumed they were the whole time, as I was still pretty blinded and couldn't see much but bright lights or shadows. My car miraculously made it, and I tore out of the dead end road back onto Indiana Street. I looked for pursuit but didn't see anyone, and made it safely home without seeing many other cars that night. The next day I went back to the area with my brother and sister, and the road close sign was back across the middle of the road, and no longer at the side. I tried to call the police, but it was problematic because I didn't have a lot of useful information beyond that they drove a red hatchback. And also there was a little girl of 10 missing around the same time, Jessica Ridgway. And all resources were on the manhunt. They eventually found her body in Leyden Gulch. But the teen of 19, accused, did not own a red hatchback. So I'm at a loss. I remember the first notable thing that happened to me was when I was eight or nine. 
I was running down the stairs and fell down a whole flight of them. During this, I had an out-of-body experience. I remember watching myself crack my shoulder blade and watching myself move my head and neck away from the hardwood stairs as I fell in slow motion. Then suddenly, blinking and being back in first person. I had a lot of weird things happen after this. Little things, like I would get songs stuck in my head. And upon getting into the car or walking into the store, the song I had just gotten stuck in my head would be on, at the exact part of the song I had been on. Once it happened while I visited my grandma in Washington, we drove to the mall and I got into this one part of a police song stuck in my head and when we get to the mall I had to use the bathroom. So we walked through the department store and she waited for me outside. I walked in where the audio on the store speaker was much easier to hear and it was the same song playing. Anyway, I always really liked these things when they'd happen. It made me feel connected to something bigger than I was and I was lucky to have figured out how to tune into it. As I got older, I played around with astral travel and had a few really bad experiences which I chalked up to a shitty nightmare. At first they weren't too scary, just really uncomfortable. When my grandpa died in 07, I had my first sleep paralysis slash talking to the dead experience. It was the day before his funeral. He was older and had been in bad health for many years before his death. It was sad when he passed, but he died in a peaceful hospice surrounded by family. I never met his mum, my great grandma, but had heard that she was an intense little firecracker of a woman. I knew she was shorter and a strong personality, but we weren't the type of family that kept a lot of photos around or talked about paranormal stuff, so I didn't know her face at all. I remember I laid in bed the night my grandpa died, and kept thinking about how I felt like I was one of the people who was tuned into something bigger, and kept thinking, Papa, please just tell me something that can make Mum feel better, something to let us know you're okay and at peace, and didn't suffer. I didn't get anything. I had literally no idea what I was doing anyway, and I fell asleep. I woke up feeling pressure on my chest, and could only open my eyes a little bit. At the foot of my bed stood this woman who was short, had a tall beehive hairdo, and wore a red sweater. She had heavy makeup on, and just stood there kind of staring at me, but kind of just existing too. She didn't say anything, but she wagged her finger at me in a be careful young lady kind of way. She smiled a little and waved. I tried to sit up, but couldn't. I felt so pressured, I eventually couldn't open my eyes anymore and fell back to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, my mum was already up editing photos for a slideshow for the funeral. She showed me the in-progress slideshow while we had breakfast, and literally no joke, she scrolled past a picture, and the same frickin' woman. The woman wore a red sweater, and had a tall beehive hairdo and heavy makeup. I yelled, what? Or something to that effect, and asked her to go back to the one of the woman. My mum explained that was my great grandma, my grandpa's mum. I told her this story, and my mum, not a big believer in this stuff, was like, wow honey, but didn't give it much more than that, understandably. I could offer no comforting words. My grandma didn't say anything to help her feel better. I asked her about the red sweater, and she said that it was her signature colour. I would often feel pressure on my chest or legs, and wake up from a sound sleep 
and feel like I was being pushed into the bed and would see things moving in my room. I would get really scared and try to squirm out, but couldn't. It was the typical feel someone in the room kind of feeling and like you were stuck and someone was holding you down. It scared the shit out of me every time and it happened about two times a month. Eventually I started cosmetology school and my friend was dating this guy. I'd only met this guy once but I knew through her stories in beauty school you have hours on end to talk that he was a badass metalhead who drove a motorcycle. Very nice and kind and good to her. He had gone out one afternoon for a long ride on a nice long canyon called Santiago. We lived in Orange County, California, and this is a popular ride. As he came around a blind corner, he hit another motorcyclist head on, killing them both instantly. I was so sad for him and her and their families. I had never known someone my age like that die. And my first thought was I wanted to do the same thing as with my mum. Have something to say or do to help heal my friend. She was a wreck. In the first few days, we'd stayed up all hours of the night on the phone talking. One night she was particularly sad when we hung up. And I kept thinking of him and asked him to come and tell me something that would make her feel better and to know he's okay. I again felt a huge weight on my chest. I started getting this overwhelming uneasiness and eventually said out loud, stop, it's too much. I don't give you permission anymore. The pressure immediately relieved. I calmed down and fell asleep and my dreams were so incredibly vivid. I dreamed that we were at the Angel Stadium and I had gotten tickets to go to the team only areas where you do the meet and greets. I was waiting in that long open door corridor where the teams emerge from the stadium. Then I was waiting for the team to walk by me on their way to the game. I saw the rally monkey mascot person and approached asking for a photo. The person in the suit greeted me by name and said, Stephanie, oh hi, wow, and removed the mascot head. Underneath was Miles, my friend's now deceased boyfriend. He and I did not know each other, but he proceeded to ask how I was and how his girlfriend was, and to give her a big hug from me, and we parted ways. I woke up and called her, and she gasped and was happy but confused. She knew he and I did not know each other, and she asked me how I knew he was an Angels fan. I didn't, and later at school, she showed me photos of his room. This was before social media, so I couldn't go look or get a photo via text, but he had been a rally monkey stuffed animal collector. My stomach dropped. I couldn't believe this weird random fact had come through. All I knew of this guy was that he wore black leather jackets and listened to some misfits. Totally the opposite of a baseball fan. I had no idea. It reinforced that I was onto something bigger and that I would be okay. I just needed to be in control and to be careful. There were more incidents like this one over time. They morphed into night terrors and sleep paralysis. I had friends who moved away and I would have dreams where I was in their room and could see everything. This was before social media. So I did not see photos or video chat in order to know what their rooms looked like, but I could describe things. It was fun sometimes as well as scary. I once was at a friend's house in San Francisco and felt like there was a bunch of kids in this hallway when I went to pee in the middle of the night. I told him I felt like I was about to bump into them when I walked into the darkness of the bathroom and we ended up investigating to find that the place 
was an old orphanage. A little while after, my boyfriend of five years at that point and I moved from San Diego to Orange County after he got out of the military. We were finally starting the normal chapter of our lives and were stoked to not be dealing with deployments anymore. We got an apartment in a little place near our parents and were so excited. It was a tiny 500 square foot, one bedroom, one bathroom apartment on the top floor of a large complex. When we moved in, I was hanging clothes in my closet and made a joke to him about this attic opening that was just like in the movie The Grudge, where the demon Japanese ghost lived in the attic, and Sarah Michelle's character discovers it when she peeks her head up there. It was literally just like that movie. So I joked to my boyfriend about it. A night or two later, I was going to sleep, and he came in to say goodnight. Jokingly, he opens the closet, peeks his head in, and looks like he's talking towards the attic hatch. Okay, she's going to be alone. You can come out now. I laughed and was a little scared, but let it go and went to sleep. That night, it all began. I woke up feeling like my ankles were being pushed into the bed. The pressure was on my feet and ankles, and I tried to move but couldn't. I saw little twinkly lights floating around the room, but knew I had weird sleep paralysis stuff before, and tried to relax and breathe, and was eventually able to fall asleep. My boyfriend was asleep next to me a few hours later, when I woke up to the house completely quiet except for knocking. I heard it directly above my head. Random little loud knocks, loud enough to stir me, and know where in the house they were originating from. I laid there listening, the knocks jumping around the house, staying in one spot for five or six knocks, and then taking a break and popping to a new spot. It went from the bedroom, to the front living room, to the bathroom across the hall, and all over the house. I thought I was the only one awake, but I heard my boyfriend move and looked over to see that he was laying there awake too, very quietly. We were both paralysed with fear and confusion. We had both been listening to this, assuming the other was asleep for roughly ten minutes. We asked each other if the other had heard it, and yep, both of us had been listening. It stopped, and we were able to fall back asleep and talked about it the next day. The knocking happened a few times over the weeks and months. One time, he came home to the cabinets in the kitchen open. Once we came home to our little futon couch tipped backwards, the bench part in the air, and the back on the floor against the door. Once, it was all the shoes pushed against the door from the inside, making it really hard to push the door open. But nothing was very confrontational. We set up a camera to run overnight at one point, but the camera was older, and we couldn't get it to stay on for any length of time. I put flour down on the floor a few times to see if I could catch any footprints. Nothing. Sometimes the house got a smell like burning. Like that same charcoal, almost wood kind of smell. I had talked to the complex about it, but wasn't sure if it was something bigger. But they came and repeatedly said nope, that nothing was wrong with any of the connections in the building. Then things started to escalate. One day I didn't have to work until later in the day, so I slept in after my boyfriend had left for work. He left as it was starting to get lightened. I fell back asleep, and I woke up a little bit later when I heard the foot on carpet sound. Really soft shuffling kind of sound. I opened my eyes a little, not moving, just assuming that my boyfriend had returned home 
perhaps come back for something he forgot. So I closed my eyes again. I was laying on my stomach on his side of the bed, so I couldn't see if he came into the room, but I knew the bedroom door was open. I felt something press on the mattress near my feet. Still assuming it was him leaning on the bed for something, I still didn't move. I felt it press further up the bed, like two hands on each side of my leg, a hand in between my legs, and another on the outside of it. The pressing down was super close to my body, and it started to draw on me that it couldn't be my boyfriend. He had to work. Why would he come back home to mess with me? I started to try and turn over. And I realised I was frozen. I couldn't move. I got a knot in my stomach and was so terrified. I could feel it pressing down on the mattress next to my hips. And I just kept thinking, Don't get fully on the bed. Don't get fully on the bed or get on top of me. I'm not sure why, but I figured if it didn't crawl fully on the bed I would be okay. But it was so hard to breathe. I started crying, and felt like I was trying so hard to move. I was going to rip out of my skin. Finally it subsided, and I was able to roll over, and I swear I must have grunted or made some weird noise because I felt like I was released. I cried and called my mum and left the house. I ended up just going to work in her clothes because I refused to go home alone. I kind of cooled off at this point after the first incident and didn't have a choice but to sleep in my apartment as I paid a stupid amount of rent for it. The same type of incident happened about once a month and after finally five times of it happening, I saw it. It was the same situation. My boyfriend left for work and I was sleeping. This time, I'm on my side of the bed facing the wall. Our bed set came with nightstands for each side of the bed, and we each had one on each side of the headboard, so there was a small walkway of space to my side. I laid there and heard the foot shuffling again. This had come as a signal that I knew that I had sleep paralysis, so I just tried to stay calm, knowing whatever it was had not hurt me before. It just seemed to want to scare me. I expected I'd feel something pressing on the bed any second, but I didn't. I had my eyes a little open peeking out, not sure if I wanted to see whatever this thing was that visited me when I was alone lately. And I saw this black figure come up to the foot of the bed, right against the frame. It shuffled really slowly up from the foot of the bed, moving towards me. I couldn't see its face or skin, but I could see it had a robe or cloak on. I pretended to be asleep but was watching it. I realised that its attention wasn't on me. It was on my nightstand. I had a small lamp, my phone, a clock, and a few rings and my necklace on top of the nightstand. I was facing towards this nightstand, and this tall robed thing was standing at it. So when this creature, I guess I could call it, it approached, and I could see its hands coming out of the sleeves of the robe. It had one too many finger joints. The hands were long and slender, delicate looking hands. And the fingers were just too long, really pointy and pale. I watched it lightly touch all the stuff on my nightstand. It would use the tip of its creepy finger to just slightly feel whatever item was on the nightstand ever so slightly just enough to make it move a little bit. I'm so focused on this horrifying creature standing right next to me and trying to stay silent and calm. It smelled like burning, like that same charcoal, almost sour wood kind of smelling. 
It didn't pick anything up, but it just seemed curious about the stuff on my nightstand. I watched this for a few minutes. It touched each thing slowly a few times, turned towards the window, and shuffled back out of sight. I sat up, and didn't know if I had ever moved that fast in my life. I ran out the house, and went to my mum's again. I almost called the fire department, because my house smelled like smoke, like this putrid, smoky smell. I was sick to my stomach, and actually refused to sleep alone after that. I would wait to sleep until my boyfriend was ready for bed, or I'd fall asleep on the couch near his desk. It started driving a wedge between us, caused a lot of fights that I attributed to negative energy in the house that we both unconsciously picked up on. The episodes of knocking continued as we lived in the apartment for a full two years. We eventually decided to move to our parents' house and started packing up to leave. The episodes of coming home to open cabinets, feeling like something was trying to crawl onto the bed even when my boyfriend was sleeping next to me, had increased to almost once a week by the time we were moving out. We were frightened all of the time, and it was terrible. But it didn't end there. I realized that I had not had sleep paralysis, or feeling like something was crawling onto the bed with me since I'd moved out, and didn't think much of it. I'd always assumed it was connected with me, and I'd never get away from it. Anyway, I was napping at my mum's and felt this immense heat, and woke up slightly, and realised I had sleep paralysis again. Only this time, I wasn't scared. Just too hot. I opened my eyes a little and saw this old man. I couldn't see his face for some reason, but he was in a tank top and shorts. I could see by his skin and general body shape that he was much older, but I had no idea who he was. He came to the side of the couch and sat on the coffee table. I laid there still pretending to be asleep, and I felt it move the hair from my forehead and lean down and breathe on my face. I started to do the thing when you're sobbing, and your stomach is heaving down with each sob because it's so intense. I couldn't feel tears, but I could feel this need to just deeply cry. It sat there brushing the hair from my face down my shoulder for what felt like ten minutes. And I just laid there, totally stuck and too scared to move. I eventually saw it get up and shuffle away, like bare feet, shuffling along the tiled floor she had in her house. I woke up, and it felt like it was letting me go, and saying goodbye. I felt like it came to me one last time to let me go. It's been four years since those incidents, and I've literally never had another one since we moved out of that apartment. My boyfriend and I are going on eleven years, and are as happy as can be, and we now live out of state. This happened almost two years ago. It was summertime, and I was about to turn 21. Even after the fact, I still looked as though I was underage. For reference, I'm a female, fairly short and baby-faced. This particular summer, I worked at a truck stop combined with two fast food chains. I worked in one of the fast food areas, Something else to mention is that this truck stop was located right next to a very busy highway. This meant that we received an abundance of customers on a daily basis. Our fast food chain was employed only by women, particularly high school students, as the area did not have many places to find work. Once I began working there, I immediately began to notice that one man stood out every time he came into our workplace. This man was in his forties with black hair, thin stick, dressed in all black, and wearing a fedora. 
No matter what, he always wore the fedora. As someone who had just started working there, I really made it a point to focus on making connections with the customers, like making eye contact, introducing myself and smiling a lot. Basically, just trying to be the best employee that I could be. The first time this man came in, he was straight faced and did not speak much. I took his order and when he left, my co-workers began to talk about how he was a weird guy. Fedora man would come into our workplace every single day and comment on my very underage co-workers appearance, even go as far as to ask them for their phone numbers. My co-workers have told him many times that they are not interested, underage and the like, but this did nothing to deter him. I was immediately concerned, but tried to give him the benefit of the doubt. My second encounter with Fedora Man was vastly different. This time Fedora Man seemed eager to see me. I recall so vividly how he watched me serve every single customer in line. Each time he got closer to ordering, his smile would grow wider and wider. Once it was his turn, the first thing that came out of his mouth was, you're a lot nicer than all the girls here. Not once did that creepy smile leave his face. I don't think I even saw him blink. I thanked him and continued with his order. Fedora man thanked me and off he went. After about an hour or so of serving customers, I was asked by the manager to step into his office. Once inside, my manager gave me a heads up that Fedora man called our gas station to personally let her know that I was a great addition to the team. Fedora man also asked for my number. My manager hoped that by telling him that I was underage, even though I wasn't, and this didn't stop him from hitting on my other underage co-workers, that this would deter him from trying to get my number. His exact words per my manager were, I don't mind a little jailbait. My manager let Fedora Man know that this was incredibly inappropriate, and Fedora Man laughed and then hung up the phone. As he had tried asking for multiple girls their numbers, she decided to finally do something about it and notified our male supervisor. The next day, the Fedora Man was approached by our supervisor as he walked into the store. They talked for a few moments before he stomped out, and he did not look happy. Later on, my manager would tell us that our supervisor did not ban Fedora Man from the store, but rather let him know that he was making us uncomfortable. This did not deter Fedora Man, as he returned the next day and specifically asked for me. I was nervous, but still served him as it was my job. This time, Fedora Man asked for my number in person. If I wasn't working, I would have said, hell to the no, but as I was on the clock, I politely declined. Fedora Man continued to smile, showing all of his teeth. He continued to return every single day and specifically asked for me. After a few days of this going on, I finally broke down and asked to work in the back of the store every time he came in, so that I could avoid seeing him. Fedora Man made me incredibly uncomfortable, and I wanted to avoid seeing him as much as possible. The last time I ever saw him was a week or two right before summer's end. After weeks of trying to desperately avoid him, things finally came to a boil. On this day, I worked the early shift and therefore began doing the usual stuff, turning on machines, prepping items, and my manager was the only one there with me. She'd stepped out for a little cigarette break. Usually we do not get customers in that early. My guard was down since I was in the back of the store where no customers were allowed and I had some music playing. I was singing along to the music and prepping for the day 
when I saw a black mass dart in front of me. I turned off my music and asked if someone was there. No answer. As I was already jittery from Fredora Man, I simply told myself that I was overreacting and turned my music back on once more. After a few moments, I felt someone behind me. I turned, and who do you think it was? The Dora Man. I let out a yelp in surprise, which only made him laugh heartily. He stated that he was hungry and wanted some food. I immediately began to scold him and reminded him this was an area for workers only. At this point, my manager returns from her cigarette break and sees that he's in the back of the store. She shouts at him to leave and states, she doesn't even like you, in the biggest voice that she could muster. Fedora Man smiled his toothy smile and simply walked to the front of the store. I refused to serve him and let my manager know that he needs to be banned. I wish I could say this story had a happy ending, but it doesn't. I ended up leaving that job a week later and haven't got back since. I occasionally talk to my old co-workers and they've let me know that Fedora Man still comes in every day, hitting on the underage girls there then asking when I will be coming back to work. I was nine years old, and we were all packed into my mother's car on a trip to visit family for the Thanksgiving holidays. Our trip took us through Tuckersville, Arkansas, and it just happened that we needed to make a pit stop for gas at the T-Rex there. I don't know if it's still there. The last time I was by that way was 2012. My mother, sister and I got out of the car and made our way inside to use the restroom. There was a man in a beige coat and matching cowboy hat, crossing the pavement nearly even with us. Though none of us saw him get out of his car or anything, he made the building before us and ended up standing beside the door, faced as if he was staring at the ice coolers along the side of the building. My mother urged us both to pass him and into the well-lit building. My mum must have had a gut reaction, because when we were all done with what we needed to do, she held us back by the shoulder and told us to wait for our stepfather. As we wandered the store, wasting time for my stepdad to finish pumping gas, the man remained where he had been when we had come in. I kept glancing at him, feeling more and more creeped out. It took quite a while for my stepdad to come in after us. I guess he hadn't needed to use the restroom and assumed we'd come out to meet him. And that whole time, the cowboy man stood by the door motionless. Finally, my stepfather came through the door, huffing in frustration because it was late at night and he was ready to get back on the road. When he asked my mum what took us so long, she answered that she was waiting for the man to leave. My stepdad raised an eyebrow. What man? In his frustration, he apparently hadn't noticed the man in the cowboy hat. That one, my mother said, suddenly very pale. She was pointing out the window, where we all saw that the man had turned to face into the store. He was grinning at us. I'm sure it was the shadow from his hat, but his eyes were just pools of darkness, and my nine-year-old brain registered this as having no eyes at all. We wound up waiting in that store for a solid 20 minutes, that man standing there grinning at us the whole time. It seemed like no one else had noticed him. The employees paid him no mind. Finally, when my mother and stepfather were discussing making a break for it, a middle-aged woman walked through the door. She made a purchase quickly and left. As the door closed behind her, the cowboy hat man very slowly turned away from us as he moved to follow her. 
We didn't stick around to see what happened. As soon as the door cleared, my parents hustled out of the building and into the car. My stepfather burnt rubber pulling out of the parking lot. We've shared this story many times trying to see if our memories match up. I know I've wondered if it was a hallucination, but there's no way that four people could hallucinate the exact same thing. This happened quite a few years ago, when I was a relatively young and sheltered high school student, probably 15 years old. Some of my close girlfriends and I decided to go to the drive-in movie theater one night, where they showed two movies in a row and the whole shebang ends pretty late at night, probably around 1 a.m. or so. The five of us all drive in my friend Erin's car, as we're pulling the seats down and setting the back of the car up with blankets and pillows. Erin recognizes a guy, David, who she'd met a few times because he worked at her gym. He was at the drive-in alone, not necessarily weird, just not something that many people did in my town, and came over to our car to chit chat. Immediately, one of my other friends, Kareen, took a liking to this guy and began flirting up a storm. It wasn't soon until Kareen invited him to watch the movie with us, inside of Erin's car. It also wasn't soon until this David guy offered us, 15 to 17 year old girls, alcohol, which we accepted. Looking back now, what a red flag. I was wary of this David character, as he appeared significantly older than us, at least mid-twenties, and gave me somewhat of a weird vibe. But since Erin seemed to know him, and my friends weren't acting alarmed, I didn't give it too much thought. We're not even 15 minutes into the movie, and I'm just too uncomfortable to be enjoying myself. Six people crammed into the back of one car, and Kareen and David cuddling and flirting and who knows what underneath the blankets, made me want to get out of there ASAP. So when David suggested that me and my three remaining friends could watch the movie in his car, while he stayed in Erin's car and canoodled, I jumped to take him up on the offer. David's car was a small sedan with little room, so he had to sit in the seats normally as if we were about to ride in the car. Although I was a little uncomfortable sitting in the driver's seat with the steering wheel between me and the screen, I was glad to finally have some personal space. That all changed when I dropped my phone and it landed somewhere underneath the driver's seat. While blindly reaching underneath to find my phone, I grabbed onto a hard object that I realized was a lot heavier than my iPhone when I began to lift it up. To my complete and utter surprise, I realized it was a gun. I had never seen a real life gun before at that point in my life. So, it could have easily been a fake or BB. But it looked real. Felt real. And was hidden underneath the driver's seat for easy access. It freaked me out, because even if it were a fake gun, what could he be intending to use it for besides intimidation? For whatever reason, my friends didn't find this as startling as I did, and they managed to calm me down and concluded that the best thing to do would just be to put it underneath the seat where I found it. That was fine to me, as they didn't plan on ever being back in his car again once the film was over, and definitely didn't plan on being in the car when David was in it. The rest of the two movies went by fine. We're drinking the beer that this David character so kindly provided to us and having a fun time. It's late by the time this second movie ends, so I'm ready to get back to our friend Erica's house where we were sleeping for the evening. I hop out of David's car ready to get back into Erin's car. When I see Erin's car is already driving away, Kareen pops up and cheerfully announces that David has offered to drive us home. How nice of him. Having no other way to get home, and being slightly intoxicated, 
and watching the rest of my friends pile into the car, I follow suit. Even though I had my hesitations, David sat in the driver's seat. I sat behind him, and Corrine sat shotgun, and began playing her signature Justin Bieber playlist through the speakers. The car ride started out normal enough, with Erica giving directions to her house, and Corrine not paying attention to anything but her Bieber, and me feeling uneasy and hyper aware of the situation. As we are approaching Erica's house, David asks us if we have time for a quick drive up to the reservoir, which was located on the outskirts of town, very isolated and surrounded by a heavily wooded area. It's probably close to 2am at this point, and the only person who even slightly knew this random man has left us, and I know there is a very real gun underneath the seat of this guy's car that he doesn't know I know about. So of course I say, no. David just says, we're going up to the reservoir. Confused and alarmed, I start politely protesting, saying we really don't have time and that we're being expected at home. Yada yada. But with every word I say, David turns up the volume of the music up louder and louder, drowning out my voice and obviously ignoring me as he starts to head up the long dark road that leads to the reservoir. I go into panic mode, annoyed that none of my friends are doing anything, especially Corrine who is still singing along to Bieber. I start to freak out, and I decide that he can't take us up to the reservoir, he just can't. What if the gun is real and he threatens us with it, or worse? What if the gun isn't real, but he still uses it to threaten us, or something? A million thoughts race to my head. I won't let him take us into a secluded area where any number of things could happen, and no one could hear us. I decide if he's going to do something to us, I would rather risk it being there, in town, on a more populated road where our chances of survival or whatever were better. So I literally freak out. All sense of politeness I felt, I needed to have a gun. I started kicking the back of his chair with both my feet, screaming at the top of my lungs that he needs to take us back now. I roll down the window and start shouting, trying to cause a scene, doing anything I can to stop this man from driving us to the middle of nowhere. I don't stop kicking and screaming until he relents, almost scoffs and says, fine. As if I was some crazy lady, completely overreacting to the situation. But you know what? I don't care what he thinks. I'm just relieved he has turned the car around and is actually taking us back to Erica's house. Once we get there and run out of the car, we wake up Erica's parents to let them know what happened, since this guy now has one of our addresses. I didn't sleep that whole night, and my friendship with Kareem was irreparably damaged from her putting me in such a terrifying situation, just because she had the hots for this guy. Creepy driving movie theater guy with a hidden gun who doesn't listen to scared 15 year old girls. Let's not meet. When I first met the bag man, I was 16. I didn't even think he was anything to worry about at the time. He just passed me by when I was biking around in one of my city's forest preserves called Riverside. Riverside was always a place where I could go when I was feeling stressed or anxious. So when I passed by this rugged looking guy in the middle of the woods, I didn't think much of it. I had other things on my mind. And for all I know, I could have looked pretty rugged myself, being all sweaty and wearing a black hoodie and biking around like a maniac. He and I were similarly dressed. I didn't have long to look at him, as I was passing by on my bike pretty quickly, but he was wearing black sweatpants that were ripped in several places, along with muddy white shoes and a black hoodie, which he wore with the hood down. I could also make out that he was a pretty big guy in all areas. He was fairly wide 
and actually pretty tall. His hair was brown and down to his shoulders. I couldn't really make out his face at the time, but little did I know I would see it in a few weeks. When he saw me coming towards him on my bike, he held up his hand all excitedly and waved at me and then began to jog while I got closer. I thought at the time that maybe he was out here exercising like me and seeing me made him remember to start running again or something. But as I passed him, he got so close to my bike that he almost bumped into me. I had to swerve a little to the right to try and avoid him, barely missing him. When I passed him, I kind of heard him shout something back to me, but I couldn't really understand what it was because I had my headphones in. I shrugged at the situation and continued to bike back to my car. It took me a few minutes to get back to the parking lot. I was pretty exhausted as I loaded my bike into the back of the minivan. Once I closed the trunk, I looked around for a moment to see if the guy had been around. I didn't see him, but the only other car that was parked there was directly across from me on the other side of the lot. It was a long, white van, like the stereotypical paedophile van. It was dirty and muddy, like the man driving it, and the windows were tinted so that you couldn't see the inside. Thinking back on this situation now, it could have been totally possible that the bag man followed behind me all the way back into this parking lot and had gotten into his creepy van and was in there while I was staring at that vehicle. He could have been watching me through those dark windows and I wouldn't have even known. When I pulled out the parking lot, I made sure that the van stayed in its place as I passed by and drove home. That was my first encounter with the bag man. But obviously, that meeting isn't what gave him his name. A little over three weeks later, after my experience at the riverside, I was home alone and it was approximately 4 p.m. I was just watching YouTube on my phone while laying in bed upstairs in my room. My dog was next to me, and we were both just chilling until my dad came home from work. While I was up, I go to the bedroom. I heard the doorbell ring, and then two loud bangs on the door. Now usually, when there's someone pounding on the door like that, it's almost always my mum, because she, for some reason, likes to freak out the dog when she gets home and a few loud bangs on the door would do just the trick. So my dog went running out of my room and tore down the steps to the front door. I followed behind him, but didn't really feel like running. When I finally get to the door, I swung it open fully expecting to see my mum, but it wasn't her. It was the guy from Riverside. He was just staring at me with this big black garbage bag in his hand. He was wearing almost the exact same outfit that he was wearing when I saw him last, except his shoes which were now all clean. I looked up at his face and saw that he had a poorly trimmed beard that covered almost all of it. His eyes were a bright blue and they stared down at me. He spoke before I had a chance to say anything. Now this will be a rough paraphrase of what he said but it's something like this. Hi there, young man. Is Melanie around? I'd love to see her. Uh, no, I don't know who that is. Sorry. I actually knew who she was because she lived a few houses down. Not that I wanted to tell this guy. I think at this point I'd have given him a smile to try and act like I wasn't completely freaked out. You see, I always park my minivan right outside my house, so it's always in view whenever I'm home. This means that he probably recognized it and me. I think I know you from somewhere, pal. His voice was deep and haunting and just kind of left me stunned. I stood there and didn't say anything, shrugged my shoulders 
and that's when he started to shake the bag. I didn't really know how else to describe it. He was just shaking the bag up and down. I never actually saw what was inside, but it sounded like a whole bunch of metal cookie cutters rattling around. The contents were poking and stretching and the bag was out at weird angles. He was just staring at me as he shook the bag and inched closer. Are you sure you don't know where Melanie is? He continued to shake the bag as he encroached on my space until we were nearly touching. My breath was shaky and I was looking down at the ground like a dog that had just gotten into trouble for peeing on the couch. Then I snapped and pushed him away from me as hard as I could. His skin was flabby and soft and his shirt felt greasy. I used all my strength to get him away from me. I didn't look back as I did a 180 and sped back into my house, slamming the door. And once I was back inside, I could hear him pound his heavy arms against the door and the clamoring of whatever was in the bag. He banged on the door for maybe 30 seconds before he stopped abruptly. I quickly sped towards the window to see if he was still wandering there, and I moved to the side to get a better angle of the doorway I saw him looking back at me. When we met eyes, he immediately started running back to his van which was parked across the street. I recognized that it was the same one from the riverside. I was disappointed to see that there weren't any front license plate numbers, but as the van started to move and pass my house. I took down the number and letters that were on the back of the van and I still have them written down on my phone. Since that incident, I haven't seen the man since and I notified Melanie that some man was asking around for her. She said she had no idea who it might be, but would tell her parents just so that they could keep a lookout too. After about a year, my mom and I were having lunch and she was scrolling through Facebook when she came upon a post from a woman that lived in a state neighboring ours. The woman wrote that a man driving a white van drove up to her house and knocked on the door, which her youngest daughter answered. The man had apparently asked her to get into his van because he had the circus in there. Apparently the mum came to the door before anything happened. Apparently the man was still being really creepy. Unfortunately, the woman didn't post a description of the name or the man, but she definitely remembers the white van. Now, I don't know exactly what the critics mean. Now, I don't know exactly what the circus means, but I'm almost positive it's the same man that visited my house, and I'm pretty sure he's still out there preying on people. Because just yesterday, the local news said that they interviewed a nine-year-old girl that was approached by a man driving a white van. So please, if you live in central Illinois in the US, watch out for anyone matching the description. You may find him. I used to work in a hole in the wall gas station out in the sticks of North Carolina. I was freshly 18 and had a new car, a crappy Chev, but it got me from point A to B and was newly promoted to assistant manager. So I was working many late nights by myself. Truthfully, I loved working alone. My boss was super laid back and his philosophy was, as long as the work gets done, do whatever you please. And we had a shotgun behind the counter, which he taught me to shoot on the first day there. So even though I would be there so late, I always felt safe. On this particular night, it was extremely dead. So with my boss's permission, I closed the store early and hopped into my car. It was probably 11.30 to 12 AM at this point. Other than being able to get out of work so early, this was my usual routine. 
nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I texted my roommate to let her know I was arriving early, as we always looked out for each other like that. I lit up a cigarette, then started on my way home. For those of you who don't know North Carolina like I do, I'm going to provide a little bit of detail regarding the terrain. From where I worked at the gas station to where I lived, I had to drive down the back roads. Those roads consisted of very dense wood on both sides. Sometimes the woods would seem so thick, you really couldn't tell where you were, especially at night. This could be intimidating to those who don't know the area. But honestly, I was more worried about deer jumping out in front of me, which was a common occurrence in this area. But on this night, I wished it were just a deer. I was driving down the road, blaring Nirvana, which was my favorite band at the time, and just being a typical 18-year-old grunge kid who had newly discovered the freedom of being an adult and getting off work. When all of a sudden, I see something in the middle of the road, probably 75 to 100 feet away. At first, I thought it was a deer, but it looked too small to be a deer. So I started to gradually slow down, ultimately coming to a stop. I have to wear glasses when I drive, mainly at night. But my eyesight isn't terrible enough for me to make it a habit. I grabbed my glasses and put them on. Now being able to see much more clearly, I almost shat myself when I saw it. It was a woman, an older woman, wearing what looked like a nightgown of some kind. Her hair was in disarray. She had her hands behind her back and was just standing there in the middle of the road, just staring at my car. Let me remind you, we are practically in the middle of nowhere. There are trees as far as my headlights can shine, and it's midnight. I'm naturally paranoid, so all sorts of questions were running through my head. Who is this woman? Where did she come from? It's midnight. Are my doors locked? Why is she out here at midnight? Should I hold my horn at her? Should I call the police? What if she has Alzheimer's and doesn't know where she is? Or what if she's an escaped mental patient? Even though the closest mental facility was only three to four cities away, I didn't exclude that possibility. I thought about calling 911, but I get my phone and, <laughs> of course, no cell service. This encounter went on for a while, just sitting there in the middle of the road, mentally questioning what to do. It's now way past midnight and she's still standing there, just staring at me with this zoned out look and her hands behind her back, as if she were observing me. I started to get tired of this. Considering that I had to be up early for work the next morning, I honked my horn at her. I didn't expect what happened next. This woman's face turns from being spaced out to complete rage. Then she raises her arms up and it looked like she was holding something in her hand. She lets out this horrid guttural scream and charges at my car. As she ran closer, I realized she was holding something sharp. It looked like a kitchen knife or a piece of jagged glass. During this moment of horror, I had a brief flashback to my stepdad giving me advice when I first got my license. If an animal ever runs in front of you, turn it into a bump bump. I love animals so I couldn't bear to hear that. But at the time I was taking my stepdad's advice, I was going to turn this woman into a bump bump. Serve the Servants by Nirvana comes on next. And I mention this because this song has much to do with the aura of that moment. As if I were in sync with the instance of time, the intensity of this song enables me to let out the most intimidating primal scream that I could, loud enough for her to hear me. The window was open because I had been smoking and I hit the gas. She was running towards my car like she was going to jump on my hood. I guess she realized I had the utmost intent to hit her, at which point this woman zigzags away from my car 
and runs off into the woods. Still in flight mode, I didn't question where this woman went. I was just glad that she was gone. So I accelerated on the gas and sped the entire way home. I got home at almost 1.30 a.m. My roommate was still awake, waiting up for me the entire time. She was extremely worried for me because it was way past the time I said I was going to be home. She had been texting and calling me when I pulled up to the house and I got all of her texts and missed calls at once. So I started to explain to her what happened. My body went from fight mode to panic as I was recounting everything that had occurred. My roommate's aunt was a 911 operator who also happened to be working that night. So she decided to text her aunt to see if there were any silver alerts in the area. Immediately her aunt texted back and said there weren't. That alone gave me goosebumps to the core of my being. There was no explanation as to where this lady came from. So deranged lady who tried to attack me in the middle of the woods in North Carolina, let's not meet. And if we do, per my stepdad's timely advice, I will turn you into a bump bump. I grew up in a very old house in rural Pennsylvania. The house sat at the base of a mountain on a country road with our four acres being surrounded by woods. Being built in the 1800s, this house still had its original horsehair plaster walls, uneven wooden flooring, and tons of char. My mother was an avid gardener, a great homemaker, so strangers would often slow down as they passed to appreciate our property, or even stop to ask questions about the house. It seemed to just be different. I believe that my mother and I are both sensitive to energies, and neither of us have ever felt safe in the house, while my father would tease us for being so silly, as he didn't believe in anything that he could not see. There was so much activity in this house, that I could probably write a book on all of our experiences. Shaking beds, slamming doors, and flicking lights were so common. I would wake to my bed shaking, grumbling something like, oh stop it, and go back to bed. I never really thought that this was out of the ordinary, until I was old enough to have friends spend the night at our house. So many of my friends had experiences in the house, that when I was in fifth or sixth grade in school, I was considered the creepy house girl so I thought I'd share some of my experiences. I had my friend M over for the weekend when I was around 12. I was going through a really terrible phase where I was really into dark subjects. I watched The Craft and other dark movies with M, who I seemed to really be connected to. I was raised Christian so I always felt a little uneasy about her interests in witchcraft and such. But I figured it was harmless, since we were just kids and she was playing around. I also had a feeling that this girl was trying to get close to me, because of the rumours that my house was haunted. We had spent the weekend watching scary movies, and had a good bit of adrenaline in our system. I think she was a little disappointed that she didn't experience anything creepy while she stayed over, and she asked if we could try and communicate with the ghosts while we were hanging out in my room. I had grown up accepting these experiences, but had never tried to make contact with anything. I always had the suspicion that most of my experiences were harmless, that there may be something a bit darker in the home. It made me really uneasy but it was about 2 p.m. that I wasn't so afraid in the daylight. So, I agreed. M sat in the middle of my room with her legs crossed. I stayed back a little, sitting in my desk chair. I was apprehensive, 
but also a little excited at what might happen. She started asking questions like, Is anyone there? Show yourself. Who are you? All of these questions elicited nothing. These types of questions continued with no result. Em started to get really annoyed and confrontational in her attempts as the uneventful moments passed, and she kept on. I was getting more and more anxious and wanted our experiment to end, and I could feel the level of tension in the room was making my ears ring. Nothing out of the ordinary was happening, but I had this sense of deep dread in my gut. I wanted it to end, but I didn't want to disappoint Em. I tried to casually end it by saying, Let's give up. These ghosts are just chickens. I'm not sure if it was because I had made an effort to communicate, or if what I said really struck a nerve, but my ceiling fan, which wasn't on, fell from the ceiling as M was under it. We both froze. We were both completely stunned, as we stared up at the swinging fan as it dangled from the electrical cords. I didn't want to believe it, and neither did Em. The fan was relatively new, as it had been installed by my electrician uncle a couple of years prior. We tried to rationalise that there must have been a rodent in the attic that must have hit it somehow, and after a few moments of talking ourselves down, Em called her mum to pick her up. I decided not to tell my mother about what really happened, as it would have really freaked her out. She hadn't been sleeping well, but she was always a little suspicious of how the fan just randomly fell out the ceiling, and we replaced it with a regular light after. Em and I didn't really hang out much after this incident. I decided that she may not be the best influence in my life, especially since the next month or so were really tense for me when I was alone in my bedroom or house. I swore off scary things, thinking that maybe it was just making it worse. But I did continue to have plenty more of experiences like this. A while after, my parents divorced, and I was moved from this house when I was 13. When I was 16 or 17, I decided to move back in with my father who still lived there. He was a truck driver and only home on weekends, so I was essentially on my own throughout the week. I was really uncomfortable in the upstairs at this point and typically slept in the living room when my father wasn't home. It got to the point that when you went upstairs, you constantly felt like something was breathing down your neck and about to touch you. So I always made my excursions up there quick and kept my head to the ground. My friend Ashley used to stay with me a lot when she was home from college due to the no parental supervision thing. We would always come home from hanging out with friends and pass out in the living room. One night, Ashley woke me up with an intense and full-winded scream. She scrambled over to where I was sleeping and screamed at me that someone was upstairs. I knew that Ashley could overreact and had a hard time getting excited over experiences in this house. So I quelled her fears by checking the upstairs with her. Nothing. She wouldn't let me sleep for the rest of the night as she explained over and over what happened. She said that she woke up to hearing a large man in work-style boots walking through the hallway at a casual stride. She screamed as the footsteps sounded as if they were coming from the top of the staircase, which enters into the living room, coming from my parents' bedroom. A year later, I had the same experience when I was babysitting my younger sister in that house alone. I woke up to hearing the very real sound of boots clumping from my parents' bedroom to the top of the stairs, where I also screamed. The whole experience lasted maybe 10 seconds, but the scariest part was how real it sounded. We didn't just hear the creaking floor, you could hear the contact of rubber sole boots on the floor. 
I talked to my mum recently, which is what prompted me to start lurking in the paranormal subreddit. And she told me that she heard things like that all the time, and ended up switching rooms with my brother early on, because she didn't feel like she was safe there. She told me that she slept on the couch most nights, because of the odd feelings in that room, as well as the footsteps. When I was about to graduate high school and move off to college, I had my last experience in the house. I remember things became really quiet after this experience, as I anxiously counted down the days until I could move to my new apartment. It was a Friday evening, and Ashley was to meet me at my house so that we could go to a party with the plan of later crashing at my house. I didn't have a car at the time, so I was waiting for her to pick me up. I had about 30 minutes until she would go back from college. So I was doing some laundry and decided to cut my bangs myself in the bathroom. We only had one bathroom that was built on later and it also housed the washer and dryer. As I was sitting on the sink cutting my hair with the dryer turned off, I knew the load of clothes shouldn't be done yet, so I flipped around and turned it back on. I found that the dry door was open, and I assumed that a shirt or something must have gotten stuck on the door and forced it open, so I pushed everything in and assured it was secure before starting it back up. I went back to fixing my makeup and less than five minutes later it happened again. Annoyed, and not really wanting to deal with experiences at this moment, I turned around and slammed the dry door shut. I stormed out the bathroom into the kitchen and checked the time. As I did this, the battery operated radio that we had above the sink turned on static. I stopped and did a double take. iPods didn't exist at the time. So we kept the radio in the kitchen so that my dad could move it around with him as he was doing chores around the house. I remember being really concerned at the time and hearing the volume quickly turn up high. The radio had a circular dial that you used to get to the station you wanted. I could hear the static adjusting as if someone was turning down the dial slowly to find something to listen to over and over. Seconds later, the lights started flickering, and the bathroom door started swaying violently back and forth. I was shaking at this point, and wasn't sure what to do. I tried to find my cell phone, but it wasn't where I remembered leaving it, and I was frantic. I thought that before I ran out of the darkness, with no car or phone, I should contact someone. I ran to the house landline phone, which was attached to the wall in the kitchen. I called Ashley to see where she was, and frantically explained that something was happening in the house. Ashley was screaming back at me as she could hear the terror in my voice, and could also hear weird crackling and the static from the radio. I distinctly remember hearing a screaming noise and spinning around to face the dining room. The chandelier-style light over the table was starting to rock violently, with the lights flickering quickly. The phone cut out. I fell to the floor from my legs shaking with so much fear, and I just screamed. I started screaming out prayers and screaming to be left alone, and it just stopped abruptly. I tried the phone again to see it was not working and ran out the kitchen door to outside. I sat in the dark for 20 or so minutes, sobbing and waiting for Ashley to pick me up. I tried to find any reason after that to not be alone in the house. Finally, as I mentioned previously, my dad was a huge skeptic. Years after I had moved out, my dad decided to take a nap on the couch. He told me he woke up from his nap with a huge pressure on his chest, like someone was holding him down. He claims that he was kicking his legs and arms, trying to get up. 
and the first thought in his head was that my daughter was right. I always assumed that he could chalk this up to a bad sleep paralysis experience. But the weird thing is that about a month later, he was in a motorcycle accident in which he broke his back and neck. We always thought that it was a little odd as he even approached some paranormal investigators to check out the house, but it never happened. At the time all of this was happening, my dad had been renovating the family farmhouse to move to, and shortly after his recovery, he moved and our old house was vacant for many years, before finally selling it last year. I'm 18 years old and currently live in Egypt. I moved here two years ago, so I don't really know how to deal with people. And by people, I mean troublemakers. The place I live in is pretty decent and I go to private school, so I've never had to encounter anyone too dubious. My dad travels a lot. And since I'm the oldest sibling, I do most of the shopping. So I always get the groceries and almost everything from big malls. One day, my hour trip turned into a nightmare. I drive a decent car, not a sports car or supercar, but it's pretty good for your average youngster in the Middle East. It's an SUV. About three weeks ago, I had a list of groceries to grab. So I went to the mall, did the shopping, paid for it and got out. I decided to try that new vegan burger that I see every day on Facebook and got one burger, soda, fries and walked out to the parking lot. I see this kid who I thought was about 15-ish and looked pretty homeless to me and I decided to give him my fries. So I dropped the bags on the back seat and was even thinking of maybe talking to him to hear his story. I was really urged to help him. After all, it's harmless, and actually, the opposite of harmless. I go over to him and shake his hand. I ask him first what he's doing out here, and he told me that he was on his way to his village, but he lost his money. Now, a lot of people have warned me about this scam, but I felt like he was in a really bad spot. So I asked him, where do you live? What do you do for a living? Which school do you go to? And what are you doing in this city? He said he's working with someone and sells stuff on the street and he sold the goods but lost his money. I felt really bad for the kid. So I offered to give him a lift to the bus station and enough money to get him there. It wasn't much, but it'd be enough for a ticket and some change. And it was pretty much on my way back. I didn't feel anxious at all about it, but I told him about my private life. Not really, just what I do and where I live. And before we head out, the more security comes and asks if he's causing any trouble. And I tell them that he's okay. We head out and I shared my burger with him. I even gave him the soda and he starts guiding me through the road. It was all fine until he asked me to take a turn down a dirt road. Now I don't really know where this bus station is, but I knew for sure that it wasn't there. So I said that I'd just check my phone and he said that it was all right, that it was a shortcut. That's when I started questioning his story in my head. I was relieved that he didn't insist. Oh well, it's not that far. Great. But still, I was certain that a public bus station would be somewhere public, right? What made me really suspicious was the phone call he got. He called someone and he said, Hey, meet me at one below the bridge. I've got the goods. Now was like, what the hell? I see no goods. Before we arrive, I said, sorry, it's dark so you can walk there. I'll drop you on the road right across from it. And he said, okay. And then sighed. He called the guy again and told him that he'd be out on the road in a white SUV. And I was really anxious. We arrive. And what happened next was the ultimate nightmare that I had ever had. Right there on the road, I see about seven guys that were obviously looking for me. Now it was a highway. 
So I thought switching to the last lane would allow me, but there was also a group on the other side. I even noticed that one of them had a stick. They spotted me and began waving and shouting. He tells me to stop here and I say, nope. I took the middle lane, gassed all the way, and they were shouting and running after me. I look at him and said, if you don't want me to drop you off here, I can only drop you at the police station, which was on the other side of town. And he says to drop him there. I said, okay, but you make it quick. He gets out puts his hand on the door in order to keep it open, like he wanted to delay my time there. But I, instead not being stupid, turned sharply and adjusted the wheel and sped the hell out of there. I don't know what would have happened if they'd have caught me. I don't know if they would have mugged me or something worse, but I don't even want to think about what would have occurred. So Muhammad and his mom Please, let's never meet again. This past October, I got the lucky chance to finally work at a haunted house. It's been my dream job since a really young age, and a friend of mine hooked me up with the gig. Maddie had worked at this haunted house the previous year, and told me how fun and thrilling it was. I agreed to work with her, and the job was overall amazing. I played Regan from The Exorcist, and my fellow co-workers said I was one of the best acts in the attraction. My bosses were also pretty proud, and even posted a video of me on their Facebook. The job was just pure delight except for one of the workers. Besides getting home at around one in the morning and losing my voice due to constantly screaming, this creepy co-worker almost soured the whole experience for me. Daniel was in his mid forties. He worked in the haunted house as a butcher. He was a tall and brawny guy definitely far more intimidating than my other co-workers who were teenagers. I was 17. So was Maddie. He's bald and had a few tattoos on his arms. Any attempts at conversation were always awkward. I'm not saying that in a judging manner. It was just visible that something was a bit off about this guy. Daniel first started to talk to me after my first shift. He was complimenting my performance and how loud I could scream, which I didn't find odd at all. All the other workers were complimenting me as well. So him mentioning it wasn't out of the ordinary. I thanked him. We exchanged names, shook hands, and that was the end of my shift. Every shift that followed the first, Daniel would always compliment me, shake my hand, and asked me for my name again, even though I'd already told him a handful of times. Then his creepiness only increased. One night, while all the workers are lining up to clock out and leave, Daniel goes on a huge rant to Maddie and me about his personal life. He mentions how much he hates his ex-wife and would love to beat her up because how she abused him. Daniel also said he is divorcing his current wife, whom he says that he still loves. I was just baffled that he out of the blue decided to rant about personal issues to two teenagers, but I brushed it off, clocked out and Maddie and I drove home on the ride home. I told Maddie how odd Daniel is, and she agreed, but argued that he's nice. So keep in mind that Maddie knew I was not particularly fond of Daniel and wanted nothing to do with him. A few shifts later, the worst incident involving Daniel occurred. The haunted house was closed and all the workers were scrubbing off their grotesque makeup 
and changing back into their regular clothes. I was out of the break room washing off my makeup with about six other people in the room with me, including Maddie and Daniel. Out of nowhere, Daniel just blurts out, man, my ride just canceled on me. I could obviously tell that this was one of those statements where he is fishing for attention. I kept my trap shut and continued washing off my nasty makeup. Maddie being an overly generous and sometimes airheaded teen quickly offered to give him a ride. The very moment those words fell from her mouth, my heart sunk to the pit of my stomach. Maddie was also taking me home that night since we alternated who drove to work. My eyes quickly shifted to Maddie, who somehow didn't see the strangeness in two teenagers giving a 45 year old man a ride home at midnight. Daniel said very happily, thank you so much, and detailed where he lived, knowing I couldn't just blurt out, no, in front of Daniel. I gave Maddie a stern look and left the room. Bewildered, I walked out of the room to change out of my sweat drained dress and into my normal clothes with the notion that I'm about to endure an awkward and creepy car ride with Daniel. I was livid at Maddie. She knew that Daniel frightened me and never thought to think before she blurted out her offer. I stayed back in the dressing room, too scared to hop in the car with Daniel, but I knew I couldn't stay there forever. So I built up some courage and returned to the break room where Maddie was. Daniel was no longer there, but Maddie was there as well as a few other workers. She informed me that another worker, a very sweet woman who's about Daniel's age, was going to take him home instead of us and a huge wave of relief washed over me. On our way home, I asked Maddie why the plans changed. What she said further corrected my suspicion. While I was changing out of my exorcist costume, our boss Joey pulled Maddie into his office to say that she couldn't take Daniel home. He elaborates how Daniel is bipolar and can get angry very easily and is violent and it's not safe for two teenage girls to be alone with him in the middle of the night. That's when the older woman offered to take Daniel home. This incident infuriates me in two ways. One, why would a grown man think it's okay for two teenage girls to take him home? And two, how could Maddie be so blind and lack vital common sense to know this was not a good idea? Thankfully, that moment passed but there's still one more incident that remains. Ever since the last scenario, Daniel stopped talking to me. If I had to guess, Joey probably told him to stop. About the second to last night at working in the haunted house, Daniel got hurt. While everyone is getting ready and putting makeup on, Daniel enters the break room with a gnarly gash on the top of his head and is spurting out pools of blood. We all thought it was really good makeup at the time, but Daniel claims he was messing with a garage door inside the attraction and it fell on his head. For such a deep cut that was bleeding profusely, Daniel seemed way too nonchalant and insisted that he didn't need medical attention. He just sat in the break room for a while with the wound just pouring blood while we all applied our makeup. A part of me feels like wounding himself was intentional, but I could be wrong. He just seems way too chill about it all. And that's that. It was really enough to shake me at the time every time I saw him. Thankfully, the room I was positioned in was no way near his, so he was never in my room alone. There is one further update I would also like to include. Just a few days ago, I was informed of something that really made my heart stop. Apparently about a month ago, after the haunted house had closed, Daniel killed himself. I wasn't told how, 
Not that that's any of my business. But the news came out of nowhere. I pray his family is doing all right, and that Daniel is no longer suffering. I used to daydream about driving across the country in an RV and seeing the world. I had wanderlust like no other, and the van dwellers of Instagram really made it look so easy and fun. I was hooked, and after I made up my mind, I bought a van and souped it up with a bed, drawers, storage, bike rack, and even a little bathroom area. The tiny home on wheels held so much potential, and the future looked bright, or so I thought. I made my way to the first destination on my list, Charleston, USA. It was beautiful, and I had dreams of spending my days on the beach watching the sunrise and set each morning. Well, as some of you may or may not know, this was a van and some stealth camping needed to be done to ensure safety and that I wouldn't get towed or bothered by law enforcement. Volume levels were low and lights were always dimmed when I spent time in my van. Not only that, but the windows were tinted and I had curtains as well, so you couldn't really see anything through them. On the first night, I decided to park in a back alley parking lot with no street lights and no pedestrian traffic. I felt safe and comfortable enough to relax and play some Pokemon on my DS. I was propped up on a pillow that was laying against the back double doors. After 30 minutes after I parked, I noticed a man walk past my van. He seemed to be in a hurry, so I didn't pay him any mind. About 15 minutes pass, and I hear a jingle sound, and then a scraping noise. I turn around and there he is, the same man trying to break into my van as I sit in it, our faces only inches apart through the glass. He doesn't see me. In this moment, I kind of reacted as you would if a dog does something that makes you want to get its attention and make it stop. I have dogs, so this was automatic, and I made a sound sort of like a ahem. <clears throat> well, that got his attention. He looks up and squints at me, and I say, get out. He goes, oh, shit, and runs out. Looking back, it was kind of funny, as I knew he didn't mean me any harm, but probably shit his pants when he found out I had caught him. It really was the next night, though, that made me realize van living isn't all it's cracked up to be. I decided to park in a more crowded area the next night. Before hunkering down, I drove to a nearby grocery store to grab food. Little naive me thought that since this is a grocery store, I should be able to have my lights on bright and not be bothered. I turned the lights up and did some cleaning before bed i.e. folding clothes, fluffing pillows, and sweeping. I notice a car across the parking lot that's cranked up with its lights on as well, but hasn't actually pulled out yet. I don't pay much mind as I finish up my cleaning. The next thing I know, the same car has driven behind my van and is just sitting in the lane, not moving. I wait for a while, and it doesn't budge, so I decide to cut off my lights and sit in the driver's seat to observe. It still doesn't move. My internal alarm system is going berserk, so I decide to get the hell out of there and crank up my van so I can leave. I need to pull out, but the car is blocking me. I start inching out in reverse, and the driver finally gets the message and drives away. I watch the car leave and stop at an intersection. There are only two ways it can go. It can either go left, which exit the parking lot, and means that the person isn't a threat, or could go right, which circles back into the parking lot, 
and means that this person is possibly a threat. I wait and watch, and for some reason I don't see which direction the car turns, and I chalk it up to being confused and paranoid. After a few minutes, I decide to leave. Remember when I said there were only two ways the car could go? Well, I was wrong. There was another way it could go, and that direction is straight, and into another parking lot. When I arrived at the intersection, wouldn't you know it? It's the car from before, and it's parked, still cranked with its lights on facing the intersection. I'm sweating bullets, and looking back over to where I planned on sleeping, hoping that I'm driving fast enough to lose this creep. My spot for the night was going to be a 24-hour gym. Lots of street lights and people walking across the lot at all hours of the night. It seemed like the perfect place to sleep. Since the previous night, I almost had a break in while parked in a dark, empty area. I parked and wait. I don't see anyone other than gym rats with duffels and water bottles in hand. I let my guard down and start getting ready for bed. Just as I'm reaching the front seat to grab my phone, I see this car, and finally, the driver of the car, a white male, peering into the windshield of my van. As he does see me, as my front window is the only window that isn't tinted, we lock eyes, and I freak out. He starts circling my van with his vehicle, so I pull out and find a parking spot right next to the front door of the gym where he can't circle me anymore. Well, Bucko doesn't give up. He parks across from me, car still cranked, lights still on, facing me. I understand that I'm in danger and decide to call someone I know that lives in Charleston. Thankfully, they let me stay with them for the night. So once I got the okay to head over, I drove out of the parking lot and drove as fast as I could to my friend's house. It was 30 minutes away and I was driving so fast, I don't even know if or how long the guy was following me for. Needless to say, hashtag van life is a lot more dangerous than Instagram van dwellers would have you think. I felt duped and eventually just got an apartment. I felt a lot safer and even though I would still like to travel, I intend to stay at an RV park the next go around. As far as the stalker I encountered, how about we never meet again, shall we? To start off, I want to say that I have a strong sixth sense. I could sense and see things that most other people couldn't. I was like this ever since I was a small child. The apartment I lived in at the time was semi-haunted as I've always had many weird experiences, and so did my roommate. But that is irrelevant, unless you guys think it played a part in the story. One night I was sitting in the living room browsing the internet on my laptop, while chatting to a friend of mine that I had met in a chat room. We were talking about the usual stuff girls talk about. She had mentioned to me a month prior that she was moving to a new house and she was eager to share pictures of her new place, and didn't get a chance until this night. As soon as the topic changed, and she mentioned her house, I got this eerie feeling. For some reason I didn't want to talk about her house, nor did I want to see any pictures of it. I got the feeling that her house was haunted, and I got creeped out. Before she could go on, I made up an excuse and told her that I needed to go. She stopped me and said, Wait, before you go, did you know my house was haunted? I was caught a little off guard, but it was something I had already known. The fact that she had said it to me, though, just confirmed it. Yeah, I kind of felt that way. She told me that her house is haunted by a little girl, but that she is harmless. However, sometimes she does get scared as this little girl slams doors and makes weird noises. My friend then grabs her Bible and starts praying. Before she could say anything else, 
I glanced over to my balcony for some reason, and I saw a little girl who looked to be seven or eight years old, in a white summer dress and bare foot, staring at me. I quickly looked away in frozen fear. Then I saw her in my mind. She was holding a grey plastic bag right under her hand, and she kept raising it. Then I would randomly see a bathtub full of water, while getting shortness of breath. I assumed she was drowned, or suffocated, and that she wanted me to know. But why the hell did she want me to feel it? I just couldn't figure out what it was. And at this point I didn't really care. I was telling my friend that I was super scared. The breathing got worse, and I almost felt like I wasn't breathing anymore. This little girl was literally making me feel the way she was feeling when she died. With the little energy and breath I had left, I had tried to call out for my roommate, but she was fast asleep in her room and couldn't hear me. I glanced over to my phone, which was on the coffee table, and tried reaching out to call 911. When all of a sudden the awful feeling stopped, I could breathe again, although it wasn't totally over. I could still breathe, and I told my friend what was happening, and she told me to tell her to leave. I was pissed off so told the little girl to get lost, and as soon as I did, she let out the most ear-piercing scream in my right ear, which caused me to almost go deaf, and with that she was gone. A few days passed, and I hadn't heard from my friend in a while. When I did finally end up speaking to her, she told me that she'd done some research on the house's history, and that she'd found out that a long time ago, a young girl had died in that house due to a medical condition called cystic fibrosis. It's a disease that causes the body to make thick, sticky mucus. The mucus is thick and sticky and clogs up lungs, which makes it difficult to breathe. That's what she died from. I don't know why she was showing me plastic bags or bathtubs filled with water. If she was trying to lead me to the answer, that was definitely not the way to do it. What could we possibly do? And why the hell should we care? Anyway, I had a falling out with this friend of mine and stopped talking to her, and haven't been updated since. True crime was, and is, one of my favourite genres of entertainment. I loved reading about serial killers and stalkers, and things like that, because none of it had ever touched my life personally. But since this happened, it's become much less rooted in fantasy, and I'm looking out for red flags. During my sophomore year in college, I was a volunteer teaching assistant for an on-campus international student program in the Northeast. Basically, it was the last step students had to take to get a certificate telling potential schools and employers I can speak English really well, and here's proof. The students tended to come in groups selected by programs in their home countries. So one semester, we might have a lot of Chinese and Brazilian students, and the next, a whole bunch of Koreans and Saudi Arabians. This particular semester, there were a lot of people from Mexico, and they all lived in an off-campus housing complex called The Suites. Now, my position. As I've said, I was a volunteer. I had some friends from the program in the past, and they knew I wanted to teach English abroad. So they put in a good word with me for the staff, so that I could get some practical skills and experience under my belt. Being as informal an arrangement as it was, I had no qualms about forming personal relationships with the students. In fact, a few of us are still good friends today. I wasn't a very outgoing person at the time, and though I had many friends, I hardly ever drank, and had never been to a party. Hearing this, the Mexican students who threw parties every weekend insisted that I come to the next one. 
The party was fun and comprised almost exclusively of international students, which was nice because I knew most of them. I got really drunk and had fluent conversations in languages I had very loose grasps on. Everything was going great, until a few of us retreated into a friend's dorm for some air. Checking their phones, a few girls realized that Pamela had not returned from Main Street yet, and no one can get a hold of her. Pamela was a 19 year old Mexican student and had gone to a local eatery after lessons that day in order to meet one of the teachers for a private tutoring session. The session was scheduled for 5pm and should not have gone longer than 730. It was 1130 at this point, And the girls were understandably worried. I asked which teacher the tutoring session was with. And they told me it was with Charles. Immediately my skin crawled. There were about five teachers at the facility. And Charles was by far the sketchiest. He was around 40 years old, half American, half Japanese, with short but visibly flat ironed black hair that partially covered his glasses. He honestly looked like a stereotypical weirdo. I tried to hop around between classrooms on a weekly basis to get a feel for different teaching methods. But I cut my week with Charles short, because he was just so creepy. The way he spoke to his students was condescending and mildly inappropriate, commenting on a girl's blouse or telling risque stories about his own wild college years, and how they ought to take a leaf out of his book. All of this in the middle of a class mind you. Additionally, he would always get uncomfortably close to the Latina students, grabbing their shoulders, touching the smalls of their back, and even grazing their breasts occasionally. He crept me out, as well as everyone else. After sharing some creepy Charles stories, we were all freaked out and ready to do something. Last anyone had heard from Pam was at 515. When she texted and said her phone was about to die. But she would figure out a way home when the tutoring was complete. It was the middle of winter in northeastern US. And a blizzard warning was in effect. The diner she was at was a three mile walk from the suites. And a few girls suggested she was bunkering down until the warning let up. The problem was that could be days. Another theory was that she got lost trying to find her way home and was now in the snow. None of us had a car. So we told a few of the boys and they formed a search party and started walking to Main Street. Just a few minutes later, they returned with a snow covered Pamela in their midst. Being from Mexico, None of these people had packed properly for a brutal winter. So when they found her, she was freezing and soaked to the bone. After a hot shower and relaxing for a bit. She told us in Spanish what had happened. When she arrived at the diner, Charles was nowhere to be found. She waited for 40 minutes and was just about to leave, knowing that a storm was coming when he finally showed up. He apologized and said that he was just upstairs and had dozed off. He lived in the upstairs apartment, you see, and asked if she wouldn't mind taking the lesson there where it was more quiet. Being a shy, somewhat reserved person who spoke little English, she complied. When upstairs, he started asking her all sorts of questions about herself. Most she could barely answer. And when she stumbled, he would laugh and chastise her for her mistakes. Last summer, two friends of mine and myself decided to go on a road trip through the American Southwest. We'd been traveling for two days and were driving to southwestern Utah, heading from Zion National Park to St. 
George, where my friend Spencer's grandparents lived, and offered for us to stay for the night. It had been a long day, with about eight hours of driving, and me having done about six of them, as well as a lot of hiking. So we were understandably exhausted and anxious to get into a nice bed, especially after the shitty hotel mattresses of the previous two days. We were also running really late. We had planned to arrive at around 8, but it ended up being around 10.30 when we got to St. George. Anyway, we finally get off the highway in St. George, when Spencer decides to tell my other friend Ian and I how his grandparents' house is right across the street from a graveyard. Okay, well, that's spooky, especially when coming by after dark, but it's not like we have another free place to stay. So what are you gonna do? Spencer starts giving us some background on his grandparents and we turn into the neighborhood. So while following the direction of the GPS, I see a stop sign around 50 yards away. Next to the sign, I see three small human-like figures. At first, I'm like, what are those kids doing? They're like seven years old. Why are they out at 10.30 p.m. on a Tuesday without their parents? Don't they have school tomorrow? We get closer, my two friends still not talking and not paying attention. And upon closer examination, the figures were not kids, but poles to road signs. I relax, then I start slowing down for the stop sign and look back at the poles and realize it was little kids after all. But something was off. These kids were perfectly still, not looking at each other or talking for the entire 15 seconds or so they'd been in my view. Which, given, isn't entirely weird. But as we approached the stop sign, they stared into our car with the most demonic little faces I'd ever seen. None smiled. They all just looked super disappointed. I don't really know how to describe it, but the kids, who were definitely present and real, seemed somehow translucent, like they were ghosts. My friends stopped talking and noticed, which was weird. It's not like these children were particularly unique, other than their odd presence at night, and I hadn't said or done anything to warrant a reaction. So they apparently were also getting the sense that something was up. The time it took to round the corner staring at these ghost children in the eyes seemed like an eternity. As I turned right, their gaze followed us the whole way, looking through us. I shouted, what the hell was that? And my friends were equally as spooked and in hysterics. A couple of seconds later, I looked into the rearview window, where they should have been, and they were gone. We make another right turn at the next opportunity, and there's the Mormon church and graveyard. Just a block away with Spencer's grandparents' house, halfway between the spooky children corner and the graveyard. Once I parked the car, all of us looked over at each other, daring the other to go out first. Finally, Ian steps out, and we head inside sprint walking, not even bothering to take the time to get our bags out of the trunk. Spencer's grandma answers the door and lets us in and we pretend like nothing had ever happened. This happened after I turned 12. At the time, my father was battling cancer for the second time. I was 10 when he beat it the first time round. However, it came back in full force. Despite hoping he could beat it again, things weren't looking so good for him. During his last days in the hospital, I would visit him. 
Despite being out of it, being a kid, it was rather distressing seeing him so pale and skinny, and barely recognising me now and then. It was especially bad when I visited him the day before he passed. My mum didn't want to upset me even further, so she sent me to my grandfather's house while she stayed overnight with him. Since I was old enough to be home alone for a while, I was sent back to my house. I spent the majority of the time alone, getting a few calls from my mother making sure I was okay. However, while I was sitting in my room playing video games, I got a very strong feeling that something happened. Only minutes after, did I receive a call from my mother telling me she would be home shortly. Thinking back on the call now, I knew she was trying to not sound upset while telling me this, but I didn't pick up on it. I still had the off feeling. I knew deep down what had happened. When my mother walked through the doors, she told me my father had passed away and broke down crying right there. I gave my mother a hug, and as we were facing the door she came through, we saw it. We saw a tiny shadowy figure materialise and walk forward into our home. I would assume it was my imagination. But the fact that my mother saw it as well, proved it wasn't. We realised my father came home immediately after passing, not wanting to leave us quite yet. Since then, I have been a strong believer of the paranormal. As she said it, he tutored her for about an hour and then made them both dinner. It was 7pm by now, and Pam wanted to leave, but he told her to eat, and that he would drive her home afterwards. It was pitch dark, and the storm was picking up considerably. A girl like you shouldn't be walking home at night, he told her. Pam was nervous, but she knew he was right and she wasn't confident she'd even be able to find her way home in all this snow, so she stayed. When they finished eating, Pamela went for the door, but he stopped her and asked if she would do him a favour. He went into his bedroom and beckoned for her to follow. Hesitant as she was, she peeked into the room and saw a full photo studio set up against the wall facing the bed. He told her to stand in front of the lights, so that he could take a few photos and then he'd take her home. Frightened and confused in a country she was unfamiliar with, with a man she thought she could trust, she did as she was told, and after a few minutes, the requests got darker. He showed her pictures of other girls, mostly college-age Latinas, who he had taken pictures of in various positions and state of undress, and asked her if she would do some of those poses. She said no, she didn't want to undress. So he pulled a pair of boxer shorts and a tank top out of his top drawer and tossed them at her. Put these on then, just a few pictures and then we'll go, I promise. She went into the bathroom to change into the clothes he'd given her, and just sat there, cursing at her dead phone on the brink of tears. For five, ten, and fifteen minutes, she couldn't even remember how long she sat there, until he started knocking at the door. Pamela, come on. I was just kidding. Come out of there. I'll take you home now. Not completely trusting him, but knowing there was no other way to get out of this situation, she exited the bathroom. He apologised for making her feel uncomfortable, and offered to drive her home, at which point she grabbed her things, said she was fine walking, and left. He didn't go after her, and he didn't try to stop her. She did, in fact, end up getting lost, and walking around town for an over an hour, she did in fact end up getting lost, and walked around town for over an hour, 
before the boys found her a few blocks from the complex. We urged her to tell this story to the police, but they said technically no crime was committed, so she told the head of the program. He accepted it a little too easily, as if he expected it, and we later found out this was not the first time something like this had happened. We already knew it wasn't, because he had pictures of other girls, but an especially ugly story found its way to us. Apparently, the previous year, a South American girl was really struggling in class and received tutoring from Charles. After two or three sessions, she stopped going despite her grades not improving. She became exceedingly closed off and stopped going out altogether, often missing classes. After a few weeks, she dropped out of the program and flew back home. No one knew her well enough to ask why, but they all had a sneaking suspicion it was because of Charles. After hearing Pamela's experience, the program immediately dropped Charles as a teacher, which just proves that this was not the first complaint against him. This last bit might just be a rumor, but I heard from a pretty solid source that after Pamela filed the complaint, the police checked him out and Charles wasn't even his real name. Turns out he'd been using fake information to get teaching gigs around the country for the past five to 10 years, and was actually a registered sex offender. He's probably in jail right now, but in any case, Charles or whatever your name is, who likes to use your authority to prey on vulnerable Latina girls who are alone in new countries, let's not meet. My brother and I were driving through Montana in the middle of the night and got held up near Bozeman because a semi had taken out a passenger van with six or seven people in it. We only have that estimation because we both sat mute while we watched parts being taken out of the van. It just so happened the accident was seconds old when we got there. A truck driving the opposite direction flashed us with alarming slow down now frequency, and we did. The driver of the semi was physically fine, but the cops interviewing him parked on the shoulder next to us, and we could hear him as he wailed and sobbed and apologized. We were watching the EMT crew pull a head attached to a neck and part of an arm while the driver started begging the cops for forgiveness. We sat there for five hours, the cops explained to us, being close up and getting out to smoke a while afterwards, that it was in no way the semi-driver's fault. It's on my top five things I would like to unremember. Arms and legs all over the place.